This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. Hi, I'm Russ Capper, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. Today, first up, Robin Canoke sits down with Jim Marston, Vice President of Energy with the Environmental Defense Fund, and they're going to discuss Shell natural gas. And then that's going to be followed by Robin talking with Robert Douglas, Vice President of Operations with MP2 Energy, an energy management services company focused on asset management and demand response. And they're also a retail electric provider. All of that after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show. Hi, I'm Robin Canoke. Welcome to another episode of The Energy Makers. Our guest today is Jim Marston, Vice President of Energy at the Environmental Defense Fund. Welcome, Jim. Glad to have you. Robin, thank you for having me. Good to see you. Absolutely. Tell us about EDF and kind of what your focus is these days. Well, EDF is one of the the large national environmental groups, Mm -hmm. and we have a little different tack than some of the organizations. We focus on bringing professionals, uh, economists, scientists, lawyers to solve big, hard environmental problems. Mm -hmm. We also prefer, where possible, to use market solutions and to work with with corporate interest. We are, in the energy area, trying to focus on on some of the hot topics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Number one, what to do about shale natural gas. We think it can be produced in a way that is uh, safe, and also good for the economy, but it requires uh, some changes in practice. We also are focused a lot on clean energy, particularly working to get the markets opened up to to new market entrants and Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, and to use the investments in the grid to provide a platform for those kind of technologies. Can you tell us specifically what you're doing in natural gas and and who's involved in those efforts? Yes, we have two parts to our our effort on shale natural gas. One uh, is to to do some science. Frankly, natural gas has a great opportunity to make a difference on air pollution and particularly greenhouse gases, Mm -hmm. but only if the amount of methane that's leaking out our so-called fugitive emissions are not too high Methane is a, a potent short-term greenhouse gas. We know some amount leaks from production all the way to the, to the, the power plant or to the vehicle, but the numbers out there are less than perfect. So we're teaming with nine production companies, some big ones like Shell that you would know, but also smaller companies like Southwestern and Talisman in a joint study with the University of Texas and a big engineering firm, URS, to actually measure those numbers. And we're trying to have a joint study where it'll be believable, credible, and not that it's seen as either an industry-funded study or an environmental uh, effort. These fugitive emissions, this is their product, right? That's right. That's the good news about this. Uh, What is leaking out is product. And if the amount is large enough, the companies are going to want to not only... Solve the problem with the revenue. That's right. They're losing product from valves and and the way they're producing it right now out out the drill hole and in their storage tanks and if the number is large we th- will we'll think they will spend a lot of money or be willing to spend a lot of money stopping that and by the way if it's small then we'll be happy because it's not the problem we think it might be so let's also talk about demand response and what's happening in uh, the texas market with demand response mm-hmm. and your efforts there well, demand response is the ability to to use either uh, more or less energy on a periodic basis mm-hmm. to help provide enough power for the entire system. In the old days, demand response was uh, 
would be TXU calling up Lone Star Steel when it, they still had a plant here and say, send your workers home and turn your electricity off. We still kind of do we that We do today. that a little bit now. <laughs> Uh, but the fact is, we have all sorts of new gadgets, monitors, and ability to turn off things that are not essential with telecommunications and computers and do it quickly. Mm -hmm. So, there's so it's no longer on and off. There's varying levels of demand response in between those that's two. That's right. And it's everything from turning off non-essential appliances. For instance, when it's really hot, uh, in Texas, and we're getting near the limit of our power plants, it'd be very easy to turn off things that can run whenever, swimming pool pumps, water heaters. Uh, you could also do, though, what has been happening with buildings and industrial facilities. The McGraw-Hill building in New York went in and did a lot of, of energy efficiency efforts, including sensors and abilities to turn off non-essential parts of their electric mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. And they now they save money on their electric bill, but they also now have the ability to go beyond kind of their regular use and at key times of the day sell back into the New York market demand response power. Mm -hmm. They'll turn things down and they're making hundreds of thousand dollars a year selling demand response or virtual energy into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, a megawatt. A megawatt, yes. And every big commercial building in the country has that potential. And it's not just commercial buildings. Alcoa now is managing their, uh, their smelters in the Midwest near the Chicago area. Again, deciding we can turn the electricity up or down a little bit, cut back here, and make more money selling into the market at peak times than making it aluminum, and we'll make the aluminum later on. And so I would have to think that would somewhat help address our ca capacity crunch, though I hate to use those words, um, that, we're, that we're facing here in Texas. Yeah, maybe we ought to call it an energy crunch or something else because mm -hmm. capacity is only part of it. It's also just how we manage our supply. Right. Uh, Dispatch issues. That's right. ERCOT, the, the system that's uh, it's quasi-governmental but has a lot of utility influence in it and who has the responsibility for reliability and keeping the lights on, uh, actually hired a, a very good company called Brattle to do a study recently. Mm -hmm. How can we deal with the fact that we're bumping up against our capacity limitations right now? And if we have a hot summer or even just a few hot summer days, we may be facing possible mm -hmm. rolling brownouts or even worse. Mm -hmm. And how do we deal with this in the short term? And really, what should we do in the long term? Mm -hmm. And they really came up with two things. Number one, they said we can build solar quickly. Uh, it takes less than a year to build a plant. And even though solar is more expensive, when you're comparing it to very high prices of the so-called spot market, mm -hmm. it looks very good it, it looks compared to that. financially attractive. does not look good compared to average prices, but compared to peak spot market prices looks mm -hmm. good. But the other thing they said is that we could use demand response, this idea of using electronically enabled technology to turn off and on things or to, or to maneuver the amount of electricity in buildings or in, a, in a industrial facilities to meet that demand was really a uh, big opportunity. They said we really ought to g get at least 9,000 megawatts of demand response really? into the system. The good news is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission had done a study for the, the nation about what, what kind of demand response was available uh, nationwide, state by state, and we have 14,000 megawatts of economically viable demand response that's available in Texas right now without us doing anything else. But it's a matter of now getting the market right, paying the people the, the right amount mm -hmm. to turn off things, and it's also getting the, the, the grid able to, to use these gadgets and these signals. And then I guess finally we got to make sure it's real. we got to measure and verify it. Absolutely. Well, Jim, thank you so much for coming in today. I really appreciate what you've shared with us. The pleasure's mine, and these are important topics. Thanks for having this program.
The future is here. You can't see it. It's At NRG, we're providing clean energy and now charging stations to make the electric car a reality. Kind of makes you want a boogie woogie, doesn't it? NRG, moving clean energy forward. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show. I'm Robin Canope. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show. My guest is Robert Douglas. Thank you so much for being here. Robert is the Vice President of Operations for MP2. And so, tell us about MP2. Thanks so much for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, MP2 Energy uh, is a energy management services firm with three different sectors. We specialize in asset management, uh, demand response, and then we're also a retail electric provider. What kind of background do you have that that brought you into MP2? My background comes from the Silicon Valley, born and raised in San Jose, California. Got my early start with uh, managing grants through the Department of Energy, then moved into the uh, technology space where I worked for a firm that created a scheduling and settlement platform for uh, wholesale energy. Ultimately ventured on to MP2, and I'm leading the asset management front for MP2. The asset management front, is that what we'd call an energy trader? No, it's a little bit different. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm overseeing the management of decisions uh, with respect to uh, about a thousand megawatts of generation amongst five different power plants and then we also have 300 megawatts of uh, demand response in the ERCOT market so, so I spend busy. a lot of time I'm very busy <laughs> very busy in this time of year summertime uh, it's extremely volatile and you want to make sure that you know your customers aren't missing out on opportunities nor are they making uh, bad decisions so uh, we're very uh, intense from a risk management standpoint so you do have energy traders, though, at MP2? That's correct. We do Can have... Can you oh, kind of explain that role for us? I think it's something that, as an outsider, very few people understand. Sure. Uh, at MP2, we're not, uh, we're not speculating on the market, so we're not ultimately taking positions. We have a retail uh, energy, um, we're a retail energy provider, and within that uh, space, we do uh, have to procure wholesale energy. So we do have a trader that's on staff that is mm -hmm. uh, managing that position so that when we sell a retail contract, we can properly hedge it. Um, obviously, you're either always going to be long or short in the market, but uh, you know we have uh, our designated trader, and then we also have people that back him up. Just out of curiosity, you back in the Enron days, the whole industry kind of got a bad name and it was, you know, do you really think that somebody can manipulate the market like, like the media portrayed Enron having done? I think there's different ways that you could uh, potentially do some level of market manipulation if you have a significant amount of market power or certain presence that you can influence the market. But I think uh, between the Public Utility Commission and the Independent Market mm -hmm. Monitor, mm -hmm that they do a fairly good job of ensuring that, you know, there's no market manipulation happening. Uh, last February 2nd, when there was a severe cold freeze throughout the state of Texas, uh, there was a lot of different power plants that did not properly function, and there, uh, there was elevated price signals, and uh, the Public Utility Commission mandated ERCOT and the Independent Market Monitor to do a significant study of all market participants to ensure that things of that nature was not occurring. Interesting. So what direction do you think the energy markets are going uh, for the foreseeable future? Well, I think within deregulation, I, th I think uh, deregulation is definitely spreading within North America. I think it's a good thing. I think within the state of Texas for the areas that ha have uh, where consumers have the power to choose, I think people are seeing the benefits of mm -hmm. shopping mm -hmm. for electricity. But I think one thing that we're struggling with today is uh, regulation from the federal government as well as uh, and how that's going to uh, accommodate our load growth. Uh, for example, there's uh, CASPER or um, essentially uh, the federal government putting uh, regulations in place to limit the amount of emissions that may be emitted. And for the state of Texas where, you know, industry is relatively booming and there's a significant amount of load growth in uh, South Texas, if uh, we potentially have to take some power plants offline, how are we going to meet the demand with supply? So I think that's a growing issue today. Right. And what role do you see renewables playing in that? I, I, think, I think renewables brings a certain amount of volatility to the market. Uh, for example, with solar, uh, you know, solar is a, is a good technology, especially with how the, the load curve is shaped with peak demand. So 
typically when electricity, when the demand is at its highest, solar is present. However, if, uh, if there becomes a situation where there's cloud cover, then obviously you're going to lose some of your solar generation. Um, with wind generation in uh, current state of affairs within the state of Texas, it's kind of inverse with the load pattern. So I think it brings a certain amount of volatility where it's displacing uh, fossil fuel generation and, and then ultimately, in essence, it's, it's, it's making other generators, it's compressing uh, wholesale prices. But I, I do think that overall, I think it's going to play a, a big part in, um, in, um, in the energy markets going forward. Right. So earlier this week, the Texas PUC commissioners uh, ruled on increasing the price caps here sure. in Texas. So we were, we're going up to $4,500 price caps August 1st? That's correct. How do you think that's going to affect your business? I think within MP2 Energy, we once again, we don't speculate on the market. Everything we do, uh, we have extremely tight risk management policies, and we hedge our retail book to the best of our ability um, through d various different means. Um, but then on So the, what was the purpose of increasing the price caps? The Public Utility Commission wanted to incent um, generators or um, independent power producers to build new generation in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. So uh, with natural gas prices compressing, wholesale electricity prices, there's a need to send the right uh, market signals to the market so that entities will be willing to invest in uh, new generation in the state. Robert, thanks for coming by today and sharing with us uh, your inside understanding of energy markets. Absolutely. It was a pre pleasure. Fantastic. And that wraps up this episode of the Energy Maker Show, heard on the radio and seen at theenergymakers.com.